Hi everyone. A while back I noticed something weird going on with the continents. You can form 60, 120 degree angle shapes around many of the continents because of some underlying crystal structure underneath the sandstone and the limestone uh, which has formed these continents. Are these raised supervolcanoes? And we're going to look at the origins of Phobos in this video. Phobos, I think, could have been ejected from Olympus Mons, the biggest volcano in the solar system. Phobos itself is made up of a very light material. So we're going to look at that in this video, and we're going to try and put all the pieces together, and we're going to look at the origin of the moon itself, uh, which possibly has something to do with Australia. Okay, let's check it out. I'm really excited by this video. We're going to describe so much. Now, this is Mars. It's a really interesting place. It's uh, ancient rock, ancient rivers, and it's got this moon. It is the lowest orbiting moon in the solar system. It's called Phobos. And people say, oh, it's so light, and they speculate it's a, it's a clump of asteroids joined together. And the official explanation for its formation is that something crashed into Mars, and then this was flung up out of Mars into a low orbit, explaining its low orbit. But in this, I've got another explanation. And indeed, it's, it's an explanation which could be applied to every, almost every single moon in the solar system, except for, I guess, the really large ones, which are captured planets. And Phobos has this uh, so-called electrical arcing or streaking or whatever. I'm not going to get into that. I don't know anything about that. I'm just going to talk about another aspect of it. And that is its density. Now, this is pumice. And pumice actually comes in different types. Now, I was uh, fortunate enough to be on a uh, exploring a volcano one day. And I noticed that the pumice at the bottom of the volcano ar around, uh, around the base looks something like this. It's heavy. It, um, it's extremely, uh, it's, it's much more dense than the pumice you find on top around the rim. And so some of the, 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 the pumice samples I was picking up around the rim have been there for tens of thousands of years, and they're light as a feather as far as rocks go. So pumice comes in different densities. Now, I'm going to say that Phobos is basically pumice. So where did it come from? This is Olympus Mons. Is it just a coincidence that it's the largest volcano in the solar system and that Phobos is the lowest orbiting moon in the solar system? Not so sure. I think Phobos was ejected out of this volcano and then the volcano sort of annealed up. And if we look at the orbits, we see Phobos in a very low orbit, but there's something interesting going on. It has a twin, Deimos. And Deimos is actually even lighter than Phobos is. So I'm speculating some heavier material was ejected into a lower orbit and then some lighter material was ejected into this orbit. And actually, everything has a different density in the solar system, which is just rather fascinating. And just look at this table. We have different densities, and these sort of explain what we need to know. So everything's based on water being one gram per cubic centimeter in weight. So uh, the pumice on Earth is actually very light. 0.25 grams per cubic centimeter, but this does vary. And then Phobos is, is actually much heavier. So I think Phobos could be, maybe it could be some pumice with some other heavier, heavier elements. And then it's been coated in water and, and other heavier organics from comets. And the Earth's crust is probably the same thing. It's probably just comets around a brown dwarf. And then we have Deimos, which is lighter than Phobos because I think it's, it's been ejected to a higher altitude. And other moons are, are quite light as well. Ganymede, 1.94. Earth's moon, 3.3. It's, it's actually a lower density than Earth, which is interesting, at 5.51. So is it really the same material? And then Titan, uh, the biggest moon in the solar system, is actually surprising. It, it's planet-like, but it's surprisingly light, 1.88 grams. And Europa 3, so that's what a watery 
a watery world will be like. And then you look at the planets. Mercury's had all the lighter water burnt away, so it's extremely heavy, extremely dense. Everything light uh, has been cooked off it. So it's just a very dense body and very heavy, so it's presumably full of heavy minerals. Earth 5.5 has got a lot of heavy minerals as well. That's why we were able to have a civilization. Mars, not so good. Not so good. Venus is quite similar to Earth. Jupiter, very light. And then we come to this, which is uh, the asteroid belt around the sun, and people suggest mining asteroids. And it's assumed they have a density of 2 grams per cubic centimeter. But uh, what, why, why would you mine asteroids if, if, they don't, if they don't have this indication of, of being very heavy, very dense in metals, when you could uh, actually go to Mercury and, and it's got a, a much more dense planet. It's probably packed, it, packed with uh, metals. Future civilizations will be mining there. And the idea of Phobos being ejected from Olympus Mons, a, a, a piece of pumice which has been, been coated in other materials, hence they're, they're, they're really not quite sure what it is because they're analysing the materials that's, that it's been coated with. It's similar to an explanation by Tom Van Flanden, who was a brilliant astronomer, an alternative astronomer, alt science. And this book, is, oh, I, I cannot recommend it. It's... To, it took me over a year to read. I had to basically put it away because he, although he's got brilliant ideas, he didn't uh, condense the book enough. It's a bit long. But one of his ideas is that the moon was carved out of the Pacific Ocean when uh, it, during early Earth, and the Pacific Ocean is the scar. Well, I've got a different theory for that based on this Phobos theory. And at the start, I've showed you, I've talked about the angles on the continent, 60 degrees, 120 degrees. You see a lot of that. And everything, the fact is, everything has a, inorganic has a crystal structure. Water's crystal structure is 106 degrees, so it's a bit different. But you look at something like quartz, and you see these 120 degree angles, um, and, uh, and other angles. And it's, it's rather interesting, and, and this is essentially what basalt is, and volcanic rocks are, and what they crystallize into. And these are quartz crystals forming hexagonal structures. I think they're the underlying basis of the continent. So what happened was, uh, what happened was you have something like Australia, and Australia is very rocky, extremely old rocks, some of the oldest rocks on Earth, untouched for, for apparently billions of years, and it's the size of the moon. So is Australia a former supervolcano, and then it's been plugged up and crystallized very quickly into a huge crystal, forming the angles around its continental shelf because of the, 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 the angles of, of the crystal quartz, which is the underlying basis of it. And then you've got that, all that old sandstone, which is sedimented on the surface. And, and, and we can go even deeper and deeper and deeper. For example, the current view is, that's our sun in the background. That's a low mass star. So perhaps something like Proxima Centauri. And then you have a brown dwarf. I think Proxima Centauri is actually a brown dwarf. And then something like Jupiter. Jupiter is, it's almost, a, they call it a failed star, but I think there is a star inside. It just gets, it, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And the conventional view is you need a certain amount of gravity to uh, create nuclear fission and nuclear fusion and all these sorts of reactions happening in the middle. I think that's all nonsense. And it's actually an electric universe. And, and if so, you can get stars going down to very small size. I think a ball lightning is a very small star. It, it is the same color as a, as a, as a typical star, so I, I don't see why not. And if so, there is a, possibly a catastrophic variable brown dwarf of small size inside the Earth, because as soon as you start digging into the Earth, they, they can't drill very far down because the drill bit melts. So there's something weird going on in there. And this is showing the this is base, this this chart essentially shows the intensity of mass extinction. So the two, the one at 250 million years ago was the biggest one. But do you see there's a repeating pattern? So either Earth is passing through, as they think, uh, an area of space, and as Tom Van Flanden thought, which is full of comets or, or debris, or this is the natural pulse of a variable star inside the Earth. That's what I suspect. And I suspect all variable star, all stars are variable. It's just our lifetimes are too short to notice this. And some have a very long variability. This is the variability of the, uh, of the Earth's internal sun. And every time you have this pulse, there is a, an extinction, a pole shift. It changes in size. 
and what then happens is the, the, the poles are restabilized, so the Earth stops spinning erratically by some kind of electric universe effect we aren't aware of yet, and then things rebuild and begin to carry on as normal once again. But there, there is a, and into every 50 million years, there's a bit of a variability, which I just find really fascinating. Anyway, guys, I hope you really enjoyed that video, and there's plenty more coming up. Bye-bye.